Inside the Fake Science Factories. Inside the Fake Science Factories, that's the next talk. And I was reading about this and I was asking myself, is in Himmelpforten a university or a university of applied sciences? And it's both or neither. It's not really sure. But there are scientists who come from this uh, uni institutions. Isabella Stein, she's a doctoral student. She invented a mob algorithm um, who improves compact technologies and trees. And she also got a prize for um, for best talk when she introduced the algorithm. Then there was a Dr. R. Funden invented. He's a fellow of the David Copperfield Society and um, um, award winner of the Pinocchio Award. And an Uri Geller fellow in advanced spoon bending. Well, okay, I made this just up. But you know, the people who um, are responsible for those avatars are Svea Eckert, Till Krause, and Peter Hornung. And what they did, and what that has to do with science, and why they had to think about this uh, rubbish, they are going to tell you right now. Give a big hand for Inside the Big Science Factory. Thank you. It's nice that we can be here this morning. My name is Svea Eckhart. I'm working as an investigative journalist at the MDR. In real life, my name is Peter Hornung, and I'm also working as an investigative journalist. And my name is Till Krause, and I work as an editor at Süddeutsche Zeitung Magazin and also working on investigative journalism. And one is missing, the one who started it all. Uh, under the name Dr. Dave Murphy, that is Chris Sumner. He is an IT security expert and a hacker, I think I can say that. And he is unable to come today because of uh, some issues with the family, but he, uh, he thinks about us right now. So, why do we want to talk about this topic? Why is this important to us? Well, Science influences us in so many ways that we um, uh, don't even think about it. In political decisions and how we behave and what products we uh, buy and in where, do, uh, where, do, where does money go that goes to science. Often, this, um, often the base for our decisions are scientific studies or scientific results. So it shapes our understanding of the world in a very, very strong way. And we love science. We really, really love science. And that's the reason why we said, okay, we have, we have to think about those fake science factories. We have to look at these in detail and we have to uncover that. It started all in this uh, smelly room. Um, the man with the circle around the head, that is Chris, who cannot be here today. And... He is a IT and security expert, and and he works in an organization who works a lot of, about on privacy, and he does a lot of studies and tries to make uh, to understand the world in a better way, and he presents the studies on at congresses and at events, and he thought, oh well, I did a decent study here with some some fellows, and I just go to Copenhagen and present this on. Yes, I pre present the studies that we did and it all looked uh, very, very well prepared and very um, to be taken seriously. And then he found himself in this room. This was the conference. And from those about 10 people, each one had had a different background. So there was political science, uh, physicists, people from geology. No one understood what the other really did. It was a really, really weird uh, event and not at all something that he had experienced at Congresses before. And so he thought, like, something is wrong here. And he came onto a phenomenon that, that existed before and Till is going to talk.
Genau, Predatory Publishing. Exactly, also so Predatory Publishing. So a predators who steal. This is a, a term that was coined by a librarian, Jeffrey Beale, and uh, what uh, he describes companies that uh, uh, that hunt scientists and uh, will steal from them. They are burglars. And uh, by this, they steal the most important value of science, which is their credibility. And we have uh, here a nice formula from Albert Einstein, Euro equals MC square. Um, something that looks like science is going to be used for financial purposes. So these uh, companies, uh, these people who give these conferences, but also people uh, who publish journals, that publish scientific journals, they just skip the basic quality control of science. They just publish everything they, you send them uh, without reviewing it and without the classical reviewing process of science. And with this, they publish these unreviewed uh, scientific papers or non-scientific papers. So who in this room has um, ever published something? Who has experience with publishing? Well, I see there's a quite a lot of people. That's very good. Uh, nonetheless, I will explain for the, uh, the rest of you um, how this basic process uh, typically works. So typically you start by submitting a study um, that is going to be checked uh, by an editor and uh, this editor then decides whether the study will be uh, reject because it might be redundant or because it doesn't contain anything new or because it's just poorly made. If this is not the case, the uh, editor sends it to the peer reviewers and this peer review process is the most important part uh, about this uh, whole process. Peer review basically is a control mechanism um, that where uh, scientists uh, check other scientists' work. So in conferences typically, um, there are specialists who uh, are, know the field very well um, and if you publish something on a conference, uh, the, there are people who check it and they ask themselves whether it makes sense. And so this peer review uh, process is not perfect. Again and again, uh, things go wrong uh, in this process. So typically, uh, uh, the big uh, publishers um, have a very strange uh, model of uh, with uh, this academic uh, publishing, um, and uh, they hide everything behind uh, paywalls. Um, but well, anyways, uh, the, uh, this peer review process is definitely not perfect. Um, there are a lot of things to work on, but uh, nonetheless, it's the gold standard we've been working with. So uh, peer review this process. Um, many friends of mine who uh, work uh, on it in the academic context um, really suffer from it. You s constantly uh, have to work on it. You have to improve, uh, but. At the end of the day, uh, it's for now the best we have uh, to uh, check um, our scientific work. And uh, we, uh, we go back and forth and back and forth and uh, if you finally get to it, you can uh, publish um, this, uh, your study. With the predatory journals, this system works quite differently. You, sub uh, sub uh, uh, you, you try to submit uh, something, um, you get some superficial comments and then you pay for it and then it's accepted. Now, uh, this process is something uh, where you have to pay uh, something to publish, uh, is something that happens in the uh, normal, in the, uh, in the good uh, scientific uh, context. Um, but these predatory journals uh, just uh, publish uh, without uh, checking the uh, scientific papers and it's just a giant scam and this is what we wanted uh, to check. Is this really the case that you can just publish whatever you want and we needed help um, from these two friendly people? These are Isabella Stein and Christian Schreibaumer. 
and we just invented a university, the University of Applied Scientists uh, and of Oversexity and Himmelporten. It's a little town uh, between uh, in Bremen and another city. Um, and with those two scientists, we started our first action or sting operation, our first uh, trying to publish. We tried to just write a paper, and it was this paper you can see here. And of course, we have to see it's. It's very simple to find out that this University Himmelfortin does not exist. Uh, and we took these names to uh, publish this paper. Please don't ask us what it says. It's uh, just pure nonsense. One sentence does not feed to uh, the other sentence. It's just gibberish. I've reread it many times, but I nonetheless still don't understand it. Um, it originated from the iGEM and it was uh, a joke from the students of the MIT and uh, you just have to type in some words and you get something uh, that um, you want. <coughs> And we uh, submitted it in the World Academy for Science and uh, Technology and uh, we went to a conference in London. Um, we had quite, uh, went quite quickly, we had uh, very superficial comments and like some comments here, uh, a comma there, but uh, nobody actually read it. I mean, we went then to this conference with this presentation. Um, as you can see here, everybody understands what this is uh, about, it's a, a, a clear uh, topic. So, and we actually uh, filmed this, how it actually was um, in London, and this is a uh, quickly cropped together. My colleague Isabella Stein, um, also from, from um, our University of Applied Sciences. See here now. <laughs> is the relationship between our solution and the analysis of the memory bus. This is memory bus. And here on the bottom and here on the top. And all of this investigation where you would need a theory of rat-like trees, but we propose another solution. Uh, we used the 90s Nintendo Game Boy uh, across the sensor network. Which means the more pressure you give on the system, the higher the scalability gets. And that's what we wanted to achieve. And how would our system behave? Yeah. yeah. And that you all know this the single particle is a reflection of potentiality of the Greek philosopher Plato. Thank you for Thank you. For yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you can clearly see that the setting where this happens, uh, it's a darkened hotel room at the fringe of London with a, just a couple of people from different disciplines uh, who did not really understand what, uh, what happens there. Yeah. <laughs> and we were thinking like, um, well, even if there's a, someone from chemistry or from maths, um, okay, now, now we're going to be uh, uncovered. So now, now it's over. Now they're going to, to see, okay, or, or even the, the people who, who organized the conference would say, uh, okay, this is not the real sites. But we just went out and we got an email and we're like, okay, now it happens. Now, now they get us. And we got the best presentation awards. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> we really were so happy about this and there were a couple of days where we just just stared at it and talked with other people from those conferences and they said, yeah, well, I also got this email and just wanted to download it. And so I think everyone just gets the best presentation of what who was there. It's not public and so no one just knows that everyone got this. And then you can go to your university or to your company and say, hey, look at this. I performed really well there. Um, yeah, you can even Google this. <laughs> if you uh, if you make a backward search on the image on the Google image search, you will find at least fifty pages where people really proudly present this. Well, who's behind all this? Well, this is really a big money printing machine. So someone who who worked along those teams, 
uh, and who uh, know a lot about Maltigo. He did some investigations. So maybe some people know about Maltigo. It's it's a tool where you can use where you can do uh, open source intelligence research. And here you can see, okay, behind this WASIT uh, conference, there's a couple of websites. And at the end, there's two people behind this, Bora Adil and Chema Adil. That's two people who you find at the at the end of um, all those threads. Chema Adil, you really find him on LinkedIn. And yeah, we were on a lot of those conferences and colleagues of us in Asia. Chema Adil does the Asia part of it. And Bora Adil, we met him twice in London. Ah, no, once in Berlin and once in London. There he is. Yeah, well, and it's really interesting because they uh, registered a lot of names of fake conferences. So even if a website uh, goes down or if a website uh, is being hacked, uh, they just can go to a different uh, domain and just transfer their business to a different domain. And I mean, if you just look at the World Academy and we um, sum it up, that's what we have. 13 events and 13 um, cities every month. That's 13,000 conferences uh, per month. And, and that's because every single one of them on two days is in 50 disciplines with 20 conference names per discipline. So you can register or you can just choose from thousands of conference names. So even if there are 30 or 50 people in the room, so it's it's really not likely that everyone's on the same event even. Uh, they get a document with a different uh, name on it of a conference. So they have in the year 157 events, 48 cities and 35 countries and 156,000 conferences. And so we think Vosset makes around 4 million euro in a year with um, absolutely minimal costs. So, well, all of this is just strange and funny and we can say, okay, there's just some damage for uh, some people, but what's the larger damage behind this? And so this is, we were looking at how, uh, how can this system of fake journals and fake conferences where nobody checks what, so, yeah, what was the most evil way to abuse this system? So if we'd be evil money makers, what would we do? And uh, we came to the example that uh, through these journals we can just publish cancer therapies that are just useless. But uh, as uh, we pretend it's scientific, uh, we can just sell it for people uh, who suffer from a horrible disease uh, and that are just go for every straw of hope. So, we were wondering, a uh, uh, magic potion against cancer, and we came uh, to the solution that bees are nice, we like bees, bees are super. Um, can they uh, cure cancer? Well, we're not sure, but I mean, who really knows? Or well, probably not. Um, and this is really the problem in this whole context. You really don't know uh, what is real and what is not. Um, so we uh, founded an institute uh, call uh, for cancer research and um, we generated a, t a Twitter account that just retweeted anything. Um, this institute, uh, well, after founding it, um, we <laughs> <laughs> we um, founded this institute um, yeah. and we wrote a study <laughs> and we uh, submitted this uh, to a journal and from our research we said okay that should be the second largest player um, in there. So it's a journal of integrative oncology, it's actually an oncology journal and at first glance it it looks it looks rather to be taken seriously and we submitted our study there which is really so stupid so damn stupid um from first glance you would see it's not science um so we again were working with the university who doesn't exist so anything we said in there we say that be be wax um 
should have a larger effect against cancer than any chemotherapy in existence, we devised um, an arrangement for an experiment which was... Um, so we are so our our design was just we're asking people as lo, as we ask them as many questions um, uh, until they say okay now I'm really feeling better just to get rid of the questions and well and we said also well um, well bees cannot get a cancer of the colon so they should be absolutely valid um, as a cure against cancer of the colon. And then we also wrote about how funny bees are and they fly around. And that's also an indicator because they have such a jaw life so much. And um, that's also an indicator that they help against cancer. And we also invented uh, a book that we cited on that. And we had it uh, in our literature um, list just because bees are beautiful. All of that is correct. But the book we actually cited is a children's book. It had excellent reviews on Amazon, but it was not as great as a scientific source. So, well, we, we thought like, okay, that this, this, was, this was really, really too much. So we just, it was so you, absolutely rubbish that we, uh, what we put in there, just diagrams of equal circles and stuff like that. So you don't even need to be an expert to, to really say this is just junk. And and shortly after, we got uh, a review that this was uh, exp important exp uh, evidence and this is really, really uh, to be taken seriously. And the bio 1990M, so that's what we called our, our cure that we thought about. And, and the only questions that we got was, um, can you just clarify what this abbreviation SITF means? Well, we couldn't really explain it but because we just invented it. And we wrote, it means signal infusion transfer function or something on those slides. And that was okay for them. And the paper was accepted and was published. We also uh, got an invoice for that, for 2,000 euro that we had to pay. They wrote us on Twitter and on all channels that they had that we absolutely had to pay this invoice. We just ignored that. And it, ev it went online in spite of that. So Professor Dr. Funden, Professor Dr. Inwent in German, so also has his first uh, um, publication. And we also think as soon as you're in this treadmill of fake science, it really, it really gets going. So we also got, um, got emails from lots of fake science uh, publishers. Um, do, you want to give, uh, do you want to give a keynote on a breast, breast cancer conference in Paris if you just don't want to, um, uh, if you want to be an editor or a publisher of another uh, fake science journal? So our stupid, just made up institute just took a couple of weeks to get a scientific publication um, to, to um, impersonate an editor of a, of a cancer journal and we could also have done a speech on cancer on a conference. So if our goal had been just to sell people um, our absolutely useless treatment on the internet, now we could have the stamp on it that is scientifically valid. That's how you can buy a reputation and, well, Lots of serious scientists wouldn't wouldn't have believed us, but that's not that's not the point. It's uh, it's about um, faking things and getting money from desperate patients. Yes, and this experiment uh, really would have been really funny if it wasn't so sad. And the interesting thing about this is really, normally you would say these these journals. I mean, it's obvious that they are fake. But the border is not really clear. Many people run to there to publish. Hence, it's not really clear that it's bad science. Like this, for example. This is uh, not funny. Uh, uh, this uh, medicine was uh, originates from scientific endeavors of the Japanese. Um, 
and it's fake. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this uh, uh, medicine is produced uh, as uh, this magical potion against cancer. Um, and uh, in, in England, it's actually being sell, uh, sold as medicine, uh, but in Germany as, um, as a supplement for food. <coughs> and this is how Andy Murky works and talks about this. From eight nations have written 150 scientific research papers on GCMF. 200 scientists, but we have written 32 of them. Here in uh, uh, Clear Immune, they clearly advertise with these studies. Twice a week, and after three weeks, I started to feel less tired. It isn't um, something that's, um, you know, just quackery. It, it is scientifically backed. And this is exactly the, the issue. Scientifically backed, uh, they claim it's science. Those are different uh, publications um, in this uh, journal where we also published uh, our bee story. This is all just fake. Uh, we uh, in, in a famous German scientist looked at it and she uh, claims these studies are really bad, um, but unfortunately for uh, non-scientists it's impossible to differentiate this. If you don't have oncological training you can't, under you can't see this. And with these uh, studies they uh, advertise this product and they say we have here these studies and it, and it shows that this is a good uh, uh, medicine. Here, uh, just a follow-up, um, David Noakes was actually uh, imprisoned by uh, 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 trialed by an uh, English court and uh, he got 15 months um, and his company uh, was um, also trialed and he got, they um, were... Well, so. So, but um, they didn't care about the studies that, that were actually fake, that were behind this. So, we thought we have to look at the, the whole of it. Uh, it doesn't, it's not enough looking at the details. And so, we picked uh, five, um, five of them, this way said, and five others, uh, or four others that we thought were relevant for Europe. And we just submitted a lot of papers and all of those computer-generated nonsense papers, we did them, and some colleagues of us did them from, from different countries. And of course, we got accepted everywhere. So we confronted them, and they said, no comment. Or they said, um, I know we're not really evil, uh, or the best thing. Well, the authors are responsible. We're just a platform. So yeah, well, that sounds familiar. To find out who publishes there uh, on those fake science uh, publishers, we thought like, okay, the, all this, the data is public, so we just scrape the data from the websites. Uh, here's an example, and just to see who actually publishes there. So is this just um, fake healers? Uh, yeah, well, who is it? Well, I'll show you at, an, at one example. How does it work? So here we see the WASIT website. It's that's step one for scraping process. You just look at the websites and see, okay, how is it structured? How does it work? How is it linked? And at WASET we see, okay, there are the abstracts. And uh, that's really practical because you can get them in a lot of uh, different file formats, JSON, uh, PDF, XML file. And that's cool because you can get a lot of metadata and information pretty easy from there. So here's an ID number. And yeah, well, the next step was that we just took the abstracts, uh, downloaded them, and well, we just counted them. Basically, that was the first thing they would add. How how large is that? So, was it has back then in June, it had around sixty-two thousand abstracts on the website and publications. And the next step is there is metadata. So we have title, author, date and some other markers, country, for example, that we looked at. And, well, those data, we sorted them, 
and put them in one giant file. So that's a CSV file. You can do this more elegantly. And if you, well, you can do it manually. If you don't want to do it manually, then you can use Scrapey or Scraping Hub. That's a platform that's a nice framework for uh, helping you, or what, which makes it relatively easy just to scrape such websites. The nice thing is at Scrapey that the process uh, of downloading and sorting it, it does it in one step and we just get a nice JSON file and this file, we can put it into a database and using different programs to analyze that. So, of course, we used Excel at one step in the process. Um, Tableau was, uh, was really, really helpful and Link Couriers um, to see networks in there and how things branch, that's the uh, tools that we used. So how we process those data. And then we just try to find out who is publishing there. And here we have some stats for you. And here you can see uh, Omics and Wasset are the big players in there. So we have almost 180,000 abstracts, 400,000 authors, yes. So papers don't usually have one author, they have several authors. And there's Wasset with around 60,000, uh, a little smaller. And we also, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> OMG, is science in danger? That was the first thing we thought. Yeah, well, then we thought, like, oh, both. Th those are really large numbers. And we thought, like, ah, is science in danger right now? Well, 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 yes and no. If we compare it to regular scientific journals with the publications there, um, so if you take the, the, the complete number of uh, scientists, eight million uh, in the world, <laughs> uh, and even if we uh, if we filter out duplicates, we just have we say okay, um, publications and predatory journals are not really that much, and besides, the idea of signs, well, there's also fake healers uh, in there. So it's just to, to get a rough frame, what does 400,000 names mean? But what, what, what triggered us in our research was what this graph, where we said, okay, how did this develop in the, the past 10 years? And so we could get the month and the year from, from the scraping process. And then we saw, oh, well, it increases. So starting from around 2013 or 14, it's even more, public, uh, more and more publications on those um, platforms. And apparently there's a demand for it. So uh, people are publishing there, there's a demand. So we have to, to uh, public, uh, publish our results. Then we looked at the countries, we say, uh, Great Britain uh, le leading Italy, France, um, Germany 1,800 abstracts, but well, that's 5,000 authors, and you have to think about that's only th those fake publishers we looked at. So I think there's a lot of more German scientists affected because, of course, there's a lot of more fake science publishers. So we also looked at uh, institutions, and was at 229 from the RWTH Aachen, uh, Hannover University, pretty uh, uh, in the top group, uh, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft in there. Well, uh, why Aachen and Hannover? They have a lot of technical uh, science topics, and and it's it's mostly technical faculties that are publishing at those fake science um, publishers. In Omics, there are lots lots of people from medicine. They don't have a lot of medicine uh, at at those university. So if you only look at the medicine, the ranking would be different. And if you look at the company of the German universities, it's a, it's, it's good company. So we have looked at um, elitist universities. Um, they have lots in medicine, and because they have a pressure to publish, and then well, just to, to get an idea how the ho how the, how it looks as a whole. Now look, let's look at some particular cases. For example, this guy. Um, he looks like an important uh, scientist. Is Bernschul's writer. He's the director of the University of Bremen. Um, he 
was member of the DFG, and he published uh, uh, in one of the journals we had also tried to publish, and he has there uh, several uh, papers where he is the first author, and he said, uh, I, confronted with it, uh, he said I, he didn't know, he didn't understand. Um, and here we have another example, it's not the physicist to the right, but uh, the scientist to the left uh, is Aaron Kramper. Um, he is from the RWTH Aachen. Um, he uh, also published uh, to a street scooter he had built uh, with one of our favorite publishers. And we also have this one. It's Mahmoud um, Ahmadinejad. Um, I'm not sure whether you still remember who he is. And here, there, on the uh, uh, left lower corner, he is the former president of the uh, uh, of Iran. Why? What are the reasons? Um, so the first reason is pretty obvious. Um, it's just a scam. Uh, yeah, scientists are being scammed. The second reason um, is the uh, publication pressure. There is this motto, publish or uh, perish. Um, there's this pressure on scientists uh, to publish everything uh, they uh, they discover, and with uh, the good journals, uh, it often takes many months or sometimes even years, and it just takes quite a long time, and this is why you take the easy route. Um, another reason is this uh, career doping. Um, one thing is like pressure, um, but another reason is, uh, so imagine you're in this situation, you have a, a project, um, uh, we have a project that, we, that starts and uh, we have uh, several people uh, and we, we, it just looks better if uh, Several uh, papers are connected with uh, this uh, project. If it's uh, cumulative, there are often uh, some that are affected. Okay. So what do scientists say to it? Um, we asked many of them. Um, the University of Hanover uh, sensibilization for the topic just uh, comes uh, with some time. <coughs> Um, the Oni Bremen said something that uh, uh, only upon uh, reading the, the published statements we understand how big the problem is. Uh, the University of Frankfurt, uh, they are uh, looking into it and uh, we asked uh, a doctor from the University of Saarland, um, well, what do you say? Uh, if somebody publishes in this and he says, well, uh, it's just really, really bad. So why is it important? So we've heard that uh, scientists uh, lurk around, uh, but also magical healers. Uh, so uh, researching with our uh, database, um, we found many uh, email addresses from uh, big companies. And this is something we had not considered before. We thought it was something inside the universities um, that is based on scam emails and career doping, but actually also big companies, global players, uh, use this concept uh, to show themselves, to establish themselves as uh, scientifically based. And actually from the German um, uh, stock, uh, biggest stock exchange, the DAX, uh, we found uh, that 12 of the 30 companies uh, actually uh, published there. One of them, uh, for example, here is big pharma company uh, Bayer um, that published there. Um, but these uh, pharma companies actually use uh, these fake journals um, as a short way to publish. Um, here they publish something about uh, aspirin, um, about this aspirin uh, plus C in the same journal as we had published our lovely paper about the bees. And they actually uh, just claim in this um, study that it has a better effect than a placebo. And well, I mean, it's, it's a weird comparison. Of course, aspirin plus C works stronger than a placebo uh, because 
there is aspirin uh, in it, but it would be way more interesting to actually see whether aspirin plus C works better than aspirin. Um, but they actually didn't ask this question. We uh, asked other scientists to take a look at it, uh, and they all said uh, in, a, in a serious journal, you, you couldn't publish this. It's just absolutely impossible. Um, or other people said, like from the Stiftung Warentest, that addition of vitamin C is just nonsensical. Um, the, so the scientific publications are really not serious, um, especially not for other scientists. And the question now is, why um, do you actually do this? And it's not about uh, scamming scientists, but it's, it's about scamming uh, the public. Um, if you t type in, for example, aspirin plus C into Google, then you actually find pretty quickly the, a study that uh, directly relates you um, uh, to this study. So the question now is if you uh, buy aspirin plus C, that it's typically costs the double um, as the normal aspirin. So. Um, we have a comparison, um, and of course you go then for the more expensive, because you can't uh, really compare. Um, so this has a long tradition just to lie to the public, um, especially with scientific studies or studies that look scientific. If you remember the discussion about um, smoking could be healthy or cancer has a lot of a lot of um, um, origins and passive smoking is not not as harmful as we thought so there's a lot a long tradition in the tobacco industry and they publish a lot um, they they uh, they publish on those less harmful products so and they make a um, deliberate advertisement for that it's it's less harmful and all of those studies just uh, land or um, um, appear at those publishers and it's just one study it's a lot of them and there's um, regulars at the conferences they they keep on appearing there and there's there's others if you look at ilsi that's a thing that a think tank um, paid by coca-cola and mcdonald's and they send the experts uh, there uh, talking about childhood obesity and nutrition and there is a classical um, this fear answer to the doubt thing at work and um, something that goes unchecked and unreviewed into public also um, if you look at uh, climate change denial so if you look at the CO2 coalition, they uh, work together with the Trump administration in the United States. You find them again in Germany. It's the IK uh, Institute, which is close to the AfD party. And they published their thesis that uh, climate change is not man-made man and that mainstream science um, is um, to be doubted. And they also go to the local parliaments. Um, so uh, they, count, they might even uh, counsel at um at local uh, at local parliaments and say okay they have their studies we have our studies so they just um sow the seed of doubt in there and if you look so we have our own rubbish published in the same very same publisher that i could publish with uh twice well that means yeah, of course, these are here critical infrastructure. So uh, companies who are um, have to provide uh, security for uh, for nuclear power plants, for example. Of course, well, the problem is uh, probably this this study is completely okay. It's it's completely scientifically valid. So it's not to be said that every paper that ends up there is complete nonsense. But just no one is checking that. So then there we have some uh, science to be taken seriously uh, next to complete nonsense and no one can tell them apart. So just to sum that up so that we have some time for a Q&A. So, well, we just look at the slide from the beginning of our presentation. So, well, science is a lot more just this an inner academic circle thing. So if climate change deniers just uh, can just publish their studies and then run around with their studies and say, oh, well, we, um, that's valid, and they try to influence people with that, 
or that we just buy products that don't work, but we find a study on it on the internet, so it influences what we buy. That means the damage for, for the public is large. So those studies and those lies, they just get mixed up with truth, it stands next to each other, it's not checked, it's not filtered, and we just, well, that's like if the TÜV, the German um, checking for, for technology and cars, they would just uh, approve every car, just any car that is submitted to them, uh, even if some cars had extremely um, large damage to the environment, um, they would get the seal and would be approved. And that's the image that um, sums it up perfectly. It erodes the trust in one of the pillars of our society. And that's why we published those findings large in uh, 23 media outlets worldwide in France, uh, Austria, uh, a lot of uh, uh, countries took part in there. So we wanted to get the public attention on that. and to uh, dismantle the system. And now there are the three slides that we <laughs> have been looking forward for the whole uh, talk. We looked yesterday and look at this. So we have to say in July there was our publication in summer and that's when our papers went live. Uh, uh, when our reports went live in Süddeutsche Zeitung Magazine um, broadcasting in Germany and well well we're looking at Vossat each week and at the conference programs and the Germans Germans are really rare there by now and also people from countries where, where, uh, where there was reports on those fake signs publisher some who go there just come from countries uh, who were there no public reports about those fake science factories, but we are going to report uh, also in those countries. So, what's our idea? What do we want to say? And what do we, we want to to enlighten people? We want that that cons consumers, that scientists, see where do you publish? Where do I read studies? And please spread the word uh, on Wazard and Omics and Co. And because that's the only way to cut the, the source of money that they get. If scientists cease to publish in those, uh, in those outlets, uh, oh no, that's, that's bad company, or I, I just don't need to write into my, into my publication list because uh, I, I would just make, make myself look stupid. And so we have um, a website and a Twitter account, Was it Watch, and he tweets regularly on news, uh, on the topic, and of course, Everyone can can uh, look at this. We just tweet this this customized search that we uh, came up with, and you can just uh, publish your name or the the the, your, the domain of your own university, and then you can check. And you can go pretty far with this. So of course, we systematically uh, we're looking for large universities, large companies, but we're sure in those gigantic uh, treasure of data, there's some pearls in there from uh, publications that shouldn't be there. So please make this Google search. Um, you can just look for suspicious moments. So what can we say? We thank a lot, a, a huge team that has been working on that. And so it's not only the three of us, it's a lot of people that helped us out. And thank you for listening to us today. Thank you. We have some time for some questions. So here in this hall, Adams, we have eight microphones. And the signal angel, could you please? Yes, okay, I see you there. I would suggest I want to see all people with questions. So let's start with the first question from microphone two. So thank you for the talk. Um, at the end, you showed a positive development, but in the long run, it doesn't help us. <coughs> so they have quite a lot of domains still in their pocket, and they can just exchange them for the old domains. And this Twitter account also is quite nice, I mean, you can take a look at it. We have like a central... Um, 
shaming spot. My question again is, how do you get there and how can you uh, get out of there? Can you uh, suggest how you can uh, give scientists an option to like get release from them? Well, that's not that easy. So there is not a central blacklist or whitelist that you can use to check that. So first, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a problem. What, what's a predatory publisher? So there's different definitions. Second, even in Germany, there is a wrong understanding of uh, liberal publishing that does not include um, that you that you uh, that you are forbidden to publish in unscientific journals. So there is not a strong will in Germany to um, set yourself apart from that. And there is a um, there is a legal component in there uh, because y people are scared being sued by those companies. So if I'm a scientist, I want to know where to publish. There's two things to do. First, there's there's a list, a uh, commercial list to lose, Kappel's list. It's behind a paywall, but there are criteria why uh, a company or uh, why a company is a predatory publisher or not. And second, the UBs, the, the, the libraries of the universities, they are pretty far. They also have uh, publication seminars. And third, you can look where do I publish? You just look at the website, look at the editorial board, look where are they? So I look at the address of this. So just check. Uh, so yes, just um, input the address into into Google Map, and if this is just a farmhouse somewhere in the wild in the states, and you make a backward search on the telephone number, and you see it's it's a Skype number. And it's it's located in Pakistan. Well, then you know, okay, that's not a not not a serious publisher. But it's manual work. You have to look at it. You uh, to to not be fooled. But universities have recognized the po the problem after our publications. And now, in some uni lots of universities, there is there have been uh, uh, doctoral seminars where d uh, doctoral students were. Um, instructed how it uh, what it shouldn't publish and you just can enlighten people and well there's even there's even uh, even a court process in the states so well let's see but maybe they're out of business pretty soon okay now we we'll continue with microphone number five back there yes um, vielen Dank für die investigative uh, Arbeit. Thank you for um, your investigative ihr wurdet ja eingeladen, eine Keynote zu yeah, halten. Habt ihr einfach nur Nein Dank gesagt oder habt ihr überlegt, keynote, hinzugehen said, und die Keynote uh, zu halten und no, vielleicht einen Auflehrer-Talk zu halten? Um, I mean, you, what did you say? Well, we, we sent a statement there, which was said, yeah, well, science is uh, is in change or the change process, and we all have to look carefully where we go. But there was no feedback from from the uh, from the event, or maybe just by chance the uh, event did not happen. And well, well, at some point we we said, okay, we are journalists. So and maybe they felt, oh well, Professor Doctor uh, invented is uh, is not the, the the person we were thought we were talking to. Okay, okay. Signal Angel. The internet would like to know how well could you understand uh, the other lectures at the fake conference? Did uh, the other people try to hide bad signs or were they just clueless? Uh, well, hmm. most of the time they, they wanted to present signs, but from very, very diverse backgrounds. So at one conference, uh, the three of us were there, there was a young scientist from South Korea um, and well, they were just on a very, very on, on a student level. They were on, well, on computer science, uh, I, I couldn't, couldn't tell apart, but it's really, really um, diverse. Um, the deliberate um, publication of bad signs, it's really difficult to do. In New York, we had a case from a German uh, scientist who just went blah, blah, blah on a topic. And we said, like, okay, so we checked it on a different space. And that is really, really thin. So no one else would have taken him. And at one conference, there was someone who just did, uh, did a PhD uh, along, along working. 
and he was talking about the the product that he did with his company and and he had also a polo hand with with the signature of the of the company and well he just did more or less some advertising for the product in a scientific way so well there was a commercial interest behind this particular talk All right, so continue with microphone ja, one. Moin Lambert ist mein Name. Morning. Danke, my name toller Vortrag. Uh, Thank you. Was mich wirklich gestört hat. Ihr habt an zwei Stellen I erwähnt. Really didn't wow, like. das ist ja so eine kleine um, Konferenz. So nach dem Motto, wenn es klein ist, kann es wow, oder Leute aus verschiedenen Fachbereichen. And, uh, wenn wir nach dem Kriterium gehen, würde auch das Entstehen von neuen Feldern und interdisziplinären Dingen, müsste man dann auch skeptisch sehen. Das ist wirklich kein Argument, dass eine Versammlung zu einem wissenschaftlichen Thema kommt. Uh, Noch eine letzte kleine uh, Bemerkung. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in this field, uh, in this question, I have to. Wenn du Anmerkungen hast, um, nachher, uh, damit hin. Ja. I have to uh, intercept. Um, if you. You're here to ask a question, also, not to fragen, give a comment. So I just uh, wanted uh, to ask whether the data um, where you uh, collected the fake journals is publicly accessible, because it would be interesting um, to compare whether, in comparison with the uh, health trends in the recent years, um, uh, whether it, uh, with the active call, for example, um, whether this correlates with uh, the fake science. Well, yes, we, we, we uh, had the intention of putting everything online, but our legal department said, ah, well, uh, we would have to go in court after this because people might just sue us for the data, and so we could not do it. And our way is to say, well, if we um, take um, single cases, and it's really easy with this Google search, then... Um, We could look at those health trends, for example, just type it in there uh, with the, with the um, uh, topics in there, and then we get the results on uh, a concentrated results on what, what's happening there. Lo and even looking at the raw data, it's really, really difficult because it's, so, it's such a huge amount. Okay, so here in the front with micro microphone uh, two. So, hello, I have a question. Uh, from a judicial standpoint, so if I publish my own fake studies on these pages and I use them to declare something, uh, can I be trialed for this in Germany? Well, we're not lawyers, but from my understanding, well, if I actually fraud someone, and say this is science and it proves this and that and then use this wrong argument to prove something I think I might be li uh, liable for this okay so then I continue with there in the back this is microphone 8 Yes, he ja. is waving Super. your hand. Oliver Thank you. My name is Oliver Molden. Um, great work. One question. I mean, this is all quite a lot of work that you're doing there. I mean, how expensive was your research and who pays for it? Uh, Peter and me, uh, we are at the NDR, Norddeutscher Rundfunk in Germany, so that is public finance uh, broadcasting. And... Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'm a pl I'm a point editor at Süddeutsche Zeitung, and we did this with our investigative uh, department, Miss Langhans, who is also an editor at Süddeutsche Zeitung. It's being paid by 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 people who have an a bottom out of this of this paper, and yeah, and so it's just classic journalism. And it's half a year that we that we that the work took, and we did also other stuff in in those in those in this time. It's it's hard to quantify. Uh, so, yeah, well, we don't have a fixed sum that we can can uh, hand out for that we can use for this. So it's been part of our work just. So we're not flying first class, and of course we have not been to Sri Lanka. There were also some talks there, but that did not work out. But in, in London we were. All right, so then the back and microphone seven, there's somebody. 
Okay, Do you want to ask a question? Frage, yes, okay, that's a question. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Habt ihr eigentlich auch uh, versucht, eure Fake-Studien bei anerkannten Genres zu veröffentlichen, so als Gegenprobe? Uh, in approved <laughs> journal? Uh, that's a good question. We were thinking about it, but we had this idea, okay, that's not that's wrong because then we would take the, the time of actual serious scientists just to look at our nonsense without knowing that so what we did is we took our papers that we submitted and we just showed them to serious scientists and they said yeah well that is absolute it's nonsense so that's what we did so we did some post post the fact uh, peer review and and some big and uh, and established journals have problems with peer review. That's that's a known fact, and they they do publish some nonsense from time to time. But this really really weird stuff that we uh, that we submitted in any t t journal to be serious taken, it would be rejected. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately uh, you don't have a microphone and we don't have a time. Um, I'm very sorry for the people who were queuing up at the microphones. We don't uh, have any more time for Q&A, um, but we will surely be able to find you. Where, where will we be able to find you? Um, so we'll be all day long here um, around the Congress um, or just uh, write us uh, on Twitter. I mean, the Twitter handles uh, are posted there. Big applause for the fake science factories.